Good evening, everybody. Hello. Uh, it's good to see so many of you here this evening. I'm Richard Screeton. I'm Head of Alumni Engagement here at the University of Manchester. We're delighted to welcome you back for our annual Cockcroft Rutherford Lecture. Hosted by Professor Dame Nancy Rothwell and delivered this year by Dorothy Byrne, who is Head of News and Current Affairs at Channel 4. Before I hand over to Nancy to introduce tonight's lecture, I've got a few housekeeping announcements to make. So can you all ensure that your phones are switched to silent? We're not expecting a fire alarm this evening, so if the alarm does sound, please follow members of the events team to the exits and assemble outside Williamson Building on Oxford Road. If you're using social media, the hashtag for tonight's event is up on the screen. Uh, so please do get involved. Uh, and tonight's lecture is also being recorded and streamed live. So hello to everybody who's watching online. Uh, so I'll now hand over to our President and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Dame Nancy Rothwell. I hope you enjoy this evening's event and I look forward to hearing your thoughts afterwards at the reception. Thanks very much. So thank you, Richard. Um, very, very warm welcome to the hundreds of you who have joined us tonight and, as Richard said, to those who are watching at home. This annual lecture honours Sir John Cockcroft, one of our alumni, and Lord Ernest Rutherford, a former staff member, for their outstanding and, of course, in both cases, Nobel Prize winning achievements here at Manchester. Science and discovery, arts, many other subjects, are an important part of the heritage of this university. And this event is a very important one as the major alumni event of the year. And I would particularly like to give a very warm welcome to members of the Cockcroft family who are with us today. The University of Manchester was founded at the time when the modern world was uh, born, and our founders invested us in progressive principles. Manchester has always been a city of change, of looking forwards, as well as valuing its heritage, and that is also true of the university. Of course, as a university, we pride ourselves in our research and our education, but we are still the only university that has, as an equal, third goal of social responsibility, making a difference to society. And some of our su successes in those areas include the works, which has helped over 4,000 long-term unemployed people get back into work. We have a, a, over 400 student societies engaged in local and global issues. We have a huge volunteering programme, which includes many of our alumni. And in fact, we have over 8,000 alumni across the globe who support students and their local communities. A particularly important initiative for us is the School Governor programme where we have staff and alumni of the university on the Board of Governors of Schools, and there are over 900 of those, impacting nearly half a million learners. And this is particularly important in disadvantaged schools, of which there are many, of course. And then we have our public venues, the Manchester Museum, the Whitworth Art Gallery, uh, the John Rylands uh, Library, and Jodrell Bank Discovery Centre, which last year attracted 1.3 million visitors. We also value the environment, both through our research and through our education, but also in terms of our own campus. We've planted many hundreds of trees and plants, and any of you who've had the opportunity to walk around the campus, I hope will have you will have seen some of the new green spaces we've created, including Brunswick Street, right opposite the main arch, uh, which is now Brunswick Park. Just behind my office um, is the University uh, Place, which is another green space where we bought a number of purple deck chairs to put into the learning commons, expecting them not to be widely used. They've been out there nearly every day, rain or shine, with students sitting happily on them. So I'm pleased that they're using the space. Of course, we're also very proud of our record in attracting students from disadvantaged backgrounds, particularly through our uh, Manchester Access programme and our Equity and Merit programme for students from the poorest countries. And I know many of you here are very generous donors to those programmes and to many others in the university. 
We're still the most popular university um, in the UK for undergraduate applications, and indeed our applications, unlike many in the sector, are up significantly this year again. Our non-continuation, i.e. students who drop out, is extremely low, less than 4%, and the employability of our graduates is extremely high. We're very pleased to uh, hold an Athena Swan Charter uh, for gender equality, and also just been re-awarded a Race Equality Charter. We've just developed a number of interdisciplinary research institutes, two of which are particularly important to us. Creative Manchester, which is re recognising the creative subjects and industries, and Digital Futures, bringing digital research and education together across the university. We achieved our highest position yet in the international uh, league table at 34th in the world and we were the fastest rising university in Europe in Reuters' assessment of business engagement. Now, many of you will know I'm not a great fan of league tables, but when we do particularly well in them, I do like to highlight them. <laughs> and there's a new one that's just come out, the THE uh, Impact uh, Awards, which are the greatest awards in achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we were third in the world and first in Europe. So I will keep mentioning that one. <laughs> we have developed uh, greatly around our mathematical research during the Alan Turing Institute and created a new Heilbronn Institute. And we've just launched our new Manchester Environmental Research Institute. We also have a new Institute for Health Policy and Organisation, which will build on the growing reputation in health services organisation and policy research and impact. You'll have seen changes to the campus. Much of it we've achieved through external funding extension to our physics building, the new Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre, the major refurbishment of the Alliance Manchester Business School, and what we know as MECD, Manchester Engineering Campus Development, which we believe is the largest single building of any university in the UK. That is really important because it will allow us to locate our research and students from what we call the North Campus, the UMIS site, onto the main campus but we will not be selling the North Campus. We're looking for a co-developer, a partner, to develop it into a world-leading innovation district. Then we're doing work on the Discovery Centre at Jodrell Bank, the Level Telescope and the Museum, and we've now secured most, but not quite all, of the funds that we require to develop the new Patterson Building after it was destroyed in a fire. We take great pride in the fact that the university, we believe, makes a difference to people's lives through our research, through our graduate students, and through our social responsibility activities. And it's through these that we like to use the quote from our Chancellor, uh, Lem Sisse, about truly making a difference. So our speaker tonight, Dorothy Byrne, has also made a difference through a career focused on campaigning journalism and investigative current affairs programmes and we're very, very grateful that she is here today with us. She began her TV career at Granada, where she was a producer-director on World in Action, the only woman on the team at that one point. Since 2008, she's been head of news and current affairs at Channel 4, and during her ten tenure, the Channel News and Current Affairs programmes, including Despatches, have won numerous BAFTA, Royal Television Society, and Emmy Awards, and others. She's also spoken at several events in the university. Dorothy is a fellow of the Royal Television Society uh, since 2000, and in 2009 received the Outstanding Achievement in Journalism Award from the Society in, sorry, in 2018. She received a BAFTA Scotland Award for her services to TV and won the factual award given by women in film and television. She's also a trustee of the Ethical Journalism Network and supports the development of ethical approaches in journalism. So we were delighted that last year Dorothy joined the panel for Inspiring Women's event to mark International Women's Day. It is my great pleasure that we're able to welcome Dorothy back this evening to give our Cockroft Rutherford lecture. Dorothy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Nancy. Um, I'm so honoured to be here speaking to you tonight, and thank you for inviting me. Last year, my great friend, 
the surgeon David Knott gave this lecture. He saved thousands of lives, and I wondered how I could beat that. So I've decided that tonight I'm going to save democracy in the UK. <laughs> I honestly believe that I have at least some of the answers, so bear with me. You may think we are in political chaos, but I can help get us out of this mess. If politicians just do what I advise tonight, we'll be heading in the right direction. <laughs> Democracy cannot thrive without trust. The people must believe in the politicians or the system won't work. And the last figures I sh saw showed that only about 20% of people in this country believe they're politicians. How will politicians win back that trust so that people believe in democracy again? Two actions would contribute significantly. Senior politicians have got to dare to tell the truth again, and they have to make themselves accountable to the people again. At present, they are not doing either of those sufficiently. Everyone thinks that the problem is Brexit, but the underlying problem is the lack of truth and accountability. Truth matters. I learned that in my first philosophy lecture here at Manchester University when we were introduced to Plato. Of course, Plato wouldn't be allowed in a university today. He'd be no platformed for so many reasons, <laughs> not least because he thought women were inferior. But Plato believed that the search for truth and the ideal of truth were key to any successful society. And it's because my life as a journalist has been about seeking truth that I ask you to follow my argument tonight and to trust me because I am not a politician. Across Western democracies, we have politicians trying to tell us that truth is relative and something that they can just define for themselves without relating it to established facts. This is dangerous nonsense. <laughs> in the lead is the most powerful man in the whole world who tells such huge and regular lies that he has a website in his honor called Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. <laughs> and of course, in order to get away with these lies, Donald Trump has to undermine the group who hold politicians to account, journalists. So we must regularly be condemned as for purveyors of so-called fake news. Well, you don't need to be as clever as Plato to realize that fake news cannot exist. If it was fake, it didn't happen, so it wasn't news. Sorry, Donald. <laughs> Imagine what Plato would make of Donald Trump. In fact, let's bring them together for a moment. What you might call a meeting of one mind <laughs> Obviously, I mean Trump's mind, because he's told us he's a genius, a stable genius. So, what should Plato and Donald Trump discuss? The Washington Post says that Trump has made more than 10,000 false or misleading claims, but I have my own favourite. The sound of windmills gives you cancer. <laughs> I love it. At first, you think it's just nonsense, not a lie, but it is a lie. And a lie very much of our time, because lying about science is rampant among these politicians who think they can just make up facts to suit them. Trump, of course, supports the ludicrous anti-vaxxer, Andrew Wakefield, who I first exposed on TV more than 20 years ago. It's a bit weird that Trump is so scared of windmills, because I'm not sure there are many windmills round Trump Tower. And it does also strike me that if he's so scared of windmills, no wonder his own rhetoric on Iran frightens him so much. But in ancient Greece, windmills were a common sight. So let's have a windmill in our little scene. Plato speaks. Truth is the beginning of every good to the gods and every good to man. Trump replies, 
Watch out, mate, there's a windmill. Put your hands on your ears or you'll catch cancer. <laughs> OK, their intellectual de discourse didn't get very far. So now let's introduce Plato to a British politician, genuinely clever bloke, whose attitude to truth transformed and many would say perverted politics in this country. Pretty straight kind of guy. Told us Saddam had weapons of mass destruction when all along he'd agreed to the invasion of Iraq to bring about regime change. Know who I mean? Here's his famous contribution to Western philosophical thought. I only know what I believe. Yes, it's Tony Blair. In our little scene by the windmill, with Donald Trump lying on the ground in terror with his hands over his ears, Plato speaks. Uh, I think you'll find truth and belief are two very different concepts. Next. Now you'll be thinking, I'm going to introduce Plato to Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn. But no way either of them would turn up to a lengthy debate and searching in-depth questioning by a Greek philosopher. The issue about them isn't lying, it's about getting them to engage in serious discussion at all. They don't even talk to Jon Snow or Emily Maitlis. They're definitely not talking to Plato. Maybe Piers Morgan or Holly Willoughby. Compared even to the fairly recent past, our current batch of politicians do very little in the way of holding themselves up to public scrutiny. I believe a key reason Theresa May failed so spectacularly is that she didn't hold herself properly accountable to the British people in general and specifically on the medium British People Trust, which is television. Here's what a top BBC executive told me about her. There's no point, there was no point in even trying to interview her. You might as well have interviewed a robot. She said nothing. Well, that communication strategy turned out to be a big success for her. Here now is what her chief press officer said to us when Theresa May became the first leader of the Conservative Party in living memory to refuse to give either Channel 4 or Channel 5 an interview during her party's conference. What's in it for us? I'm always suspicious of a man who calls himself us. I don't care what's in it for you, good sir. You're irrelevant and probably vastly overpaid. It was her duty, and Theresa May talked a lot about duty, to be held accountable. It's supposed to be about what's in it for us, the voters. And you know what, Theresa? Jon Snow or Krishnan Guru Murthy would have given you a fairer hearing than you received from many members of your own party. Every major broadcaster in this country signed a letter of protest about Theresa May refusing to do that interview. Thank you, other broadcasters. You didn't just protest for us, you protested, and I know this, on behalf of British people, because British journalists believe in British democracy. Indeed, I posit here tonight that British journalists have more belief and confidence in the British system of democracy than some of the politicians who have given up their proper involvement in the system. Now, here's where I admit I've cheated you. I already know you trust me. You don't trust politicians and you don't trust newspaper journalists, but you do really trust British television. <laughs> Overall, figures from Ofcom, our regulator, show that 70% of the British people trust TV news. Channel 4 news figures show that 90% of our news viewers say we are independent of government. That's the highest of any mainstream news programme, and I'm really proud of it. It's up seven points on last year. So politicians, if you want people to trust you again, start appearing properly on the media people trust. Be held to account there so you can be seen to be honest and transparent. We are really lucky in this country to have regulated, trusted television, which is bound to be duly impartial. So many other Western democracies don't have this, and our politicians should be using it. 
And it's even more vital to use now because of the rubbish spewing out across the internet. A Reuters Institute report last year, which surveyed people across 40 countries, found that only 23% of the public trusted news they found on the internet. Note, that figure is pretty similar to the small percentage of people in this country who trust politicians. So if politicians want to be trusted, just communicating through social media and trying to bypass the so-called mainstream media, like Channel 4 and the BBC, which is what some of them are attempting, is not the way to go. That way too, they are only preaching to the converted and not reaching out to all voters. Of course, some of you are thinking that if politicians do long interviews, they get interrupted and attacked. And there was a period during which, in my view, some leading TV interviewers treated the grilling of politicians as some sort of game. Hours were spent preparing tricks and traps. But you, the viewers, the voters, complained to us. You told us you thought it was unfair and unpleasant, and I agree. There were times when I myself would shout at the screen or into the radio, for God's sake, just let him speak. And I'm not saying it never happens now, but it shouldn't happen. It was wrong and undermined democratic debate in this country. And if you see it happen on Channel 4, complain to me. But that's not why politicians are not coming on TV now. Victoria Derbyshire, does she remind you of Jeremy Paxman? No, his style of interviewing and hers are quite different. But for three years, the Victoria Derbyshire show on the BBC investigated a huge range of problems concerning issues covered by the Department of Work and Pensions, including really important problems like universal credit. And in that three-year period, not even a junior minister from that department agreed to come on once to answer the points made. Politicians will go on news at 10 where they can give a short clip and be in control, but they want to avoid the hard stuff. They complain about soundbite politics, but too often they won't talk for longer than a soundbite. Some of these bites are so short and repeated so endlessly that they become meaningless. <clears throat> Brexit means Brexit. What would Plato have thought <laughs> of Brexit means Brexit? Well, it didn't mean Brexit because we haven't got Brexit. How useful is it to public debate to just keep repeating it? Now, some of my kinder colleagues told me things like this when I said I was coming to speak to you tonight. They don't dare say anything because if they make one slip, it's blown up in the social media. They feel they have too much to lose. They don't dare show even a bit of leg. Hang on a minute. Politicians are genuinely brave people. Every day now, when they go to work, they risk being abused, attacked, murdered by terrorists or a deranged extremist, and yet they're afraid to tell the truth? That's not good enough. Here's the truth about being a politician in the UK now. Anyone could kill me at any time. Jess Phillips said that, and she's right, sadly. So politics, Politicians literally risk death and they won't come on TV to talk to Jon Snow. I mean, what's the worst he's going to do to you? Dazzle you with his tie? Or did some of them mix him up with the other Jon Snow? <laughs> now, here's something that might surprise you. A lot of journalists think a lot of politicians are really admirable people. Most MPs wanted to go into politics to make the world a better place. That's the political journalist, Isabel Hardman. Genuinely, I think most journalists think most politicians have at least some good motivations. We are not cynical about politicians. In fact, we probably believe them more often than we ought to. Do you remember when the government agreed in 2016 to take in 480 unaccompanied child refugees after a campaign by Lord Dubbs. I was the poor dupe who immediately commissioned a film in which we would follow those children. Over months and months, in fact, for more than a year, I kept 
harassing the production company about their failure to crack on with the project. I thought they were remiss, and they kept saying to me, we can't find any children. And it turned out they were not to blame at all, because by November 2018, just 20 children came in under that scheme, and 240 unaccompanied children were admitted in total. How many times in recent years have journalists who work for Channel 4 told me in absolute indignation that they have discovered a government announcement of a new sum of money or a new policy was really just the same sum of money or the same policy that had been announced months before. If these journalists were so cynical, they wouldn't be so outraged. So please, all politicians, can you just be straight with us? They can make it hard for us to do our jobs properly. A most annoying habit of ministers is to give broadcast interviews before they've released the full details of what they're talking about. And I'm very grateful to Michael Craig to, for pointing me towards a very good article by Neil Merrick in the recent edition of The Journalist, citing an excellent example of this. Housing and Communities Minister, Secretary James Brokenshire gave early morning TV and radio interviews about plans to cut rough sleeping. The interviews had to be based on what the government itself had told the journalists because the 77-page document containing the actual policy wasn't available until later in the day. The same happened the next day with a green paper on social housing. As Merrick says, ministers could sit back in the knowledge that the message had reached the right places in the way they wished and any subsequent scrutiny by journalists would not attract much attention. That should stop. Conversely, nowadays when something goes wrong, some politicians just disappear. When it was revealed that Christopher Grayling had given a ferry contract to a company that had no ferries, he disappeared and Matt Hancock had to answer for him. And then there were the new railway timetables. Where was Christopher Grayling when that went wrong? Stuck in the lost property office, perhaps? At times, we have to go to ludicrous efforts to get interviews. When Cathy Newman was investigating allegations of sexual harassment against the Lib Dem peer Lord Renard, allegations he denied, the only way she could get an interview with Nick Clegg as leader of the Liberal Democrats was to ring into his LBC programme as Cathy from Dulwich <laughs> and force him to take her question live on air. And there's another technique politicians use. You have just one question. Could you imagine Plato saying, you have just one question? You can see a great example of this when our Scotland correspondent, Kieran Jenkins, interviewed Jeremy Corbyn about Europe. I was going to show it to you, but it's really boring. <laughs> because, guess what? He only got one question, and Corbyn didn't answer it. It was a good question. Do you honestly believe that Britain will be better off outside the EU? I just wish I could tell you the answer. But here's my big tip of the night. If you ever go on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and you get to phone a friend, don't phone Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> you could lose a lot of money. Of course, the most daring interview of last year was carried out by Richard Meadley. I began my career with Richard here at Granada Reports. Here, for ITV, he was interviewing Gavin Williamson, and Richard did something every journalist has dreamed of. He terminated the interview when Williamson refused to answer his question about having told Russia to shut up and go away over the scripple poisoning. Let's just enjoy it. 
But I'd like to pay tribute to the health service personnel. No, sorry, can you answer the question? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm sure you do want to pay tribute to them. We all, no, no, Mr. Williamson. I asked you a straight question. We can talk about tributes to the, to the health services in a minute. Do you regret using that kind of casual language? That's the question. Can you answer that question? Well, what we saw is we saw an atrocious attack on British soil. Uh, you saw British and you know, British citizen and his daughter that were targeted. And actually, how we responded to that is the world united behind Britain. Yes. Do, you regret, do you regret telling Russia to shut up and go divided. away? Mr. Williamson, and please actually, answer the question. Uh, Mr. Working, Williamson, Mr. Williamson, you're not, just not answering the question. And I, Mr. Williamson, I'm asking the question not on my behalf, but on behalf of our viewers. So, on behalf of the viewers, would you please answer the question? Do you now regret telling a nation state to shut up and go away? Do you think that was too casual an expression? Can you please answer that question? Well, I, I think. I think, if, uh, I think that what everyone saw is Russia's uh, actions against our, uh, our citizens in a, uh, in a city here in the United Kingdom. Yes, you're telling us what we know. We know what happened in the city. Well, we know what happened did. in Salisbury. We know how atrocious it was. We know how close these people came to death. The question is, I'll try it one more time. Do you regret using very casual Trump-esque language like shut up and go away? Please don't tell me what happened, because we know what happened. Do you regret using that language? That is the question. Well, what, what was right is actually when we came together with our allies and made it absolutely clear to Russia. Okay. They all right, they, couldn't act okay. in their, that's right. behaviour, and all I think right. that was the right All right, thing interview to do. terminated because you won't answer the question. <laughs> oh. Did you notice how even the elephants didn't want to talk to Gavin Williamson? I thought of that interview when we heard that Williamson was grilled over the security leak about Huawei. I imagine secret people and Theresa May all trying to get the truth out of him and Williamson saying, I must insist on expressing my very strong support for the nurses of this country. <laughs> But even what you can see with your own eyes on TV can be misleading. Here's what a top BBC person told me about quite a few press conferences you see. Press conferences look real. The politician is on one side and the journalists are on the other. But the chance of a question which is not pre-arranged being taken out of the blue by a journalist sitting there is very low. What's scary is that that could be Russia you were talking about. The disturbing point is that it looks the way it used to be, but it isn't. Even in the recent past, our politicians were more openly accountable. Blair, Brown, Cameron and Clegg held regular press conferences, but not May and Corbyn. They might do a 10-minute interview with Andrew Marr or 15-minute interviews during, during conference, but they don't do half-hour or 45-minute interviews as politicians used to. Journalists following the 2017 election complained that May and Corbyn did only one or two events a day. During the 1987 election, Thatcher and Kinnock chaired their own daily press conferences each morning. In the past, during an election campaign, party leaders would do several full-length interviews. Both Miliband and Cameron, in fact, did extensive interviews in their election campaigns. During the whole election, European election campaign we have just had, neither May nor Corbyn, as far as I am aware, did a substantial interview with any broadcaster. They didn't even do interviews on the night of the results. Now, I know those results were embarrassing for them, but so what? That's their job. Older politicians are appalled by what's going on. As Ken Clark said recently on Christian Guru Murthy's podcast, Ways to Change the World, under Thatcher and Major, senior politicians were expected to go out and justify their policies at length. Part of the job, I always thought is what Clark said, and he was right. Now, I wouldn't be a journalist if I didn't quote a man in a pub tonight. So here's what a man in a pub said to me on Monday night. 
they're not really proper politicians anymore. Politicians need to control their gatekeepers and not the other way around. We all have gatekeepers. For example, I thought I might say some controversial things tonight and that some of our press officers might be concerned. So I didn't tell them what I was going to say. <laughs> <coughs> Problem solved. You could have done that, Teresa. You are not a robot. You could be free too. People voted for you and not your spin doctors. Since Theresa May became Prime Minister, we estimate that the longest interview she has done for Channel 4 News is seven minutes. But on a daily basis too, journalists are struggling to get politicians to answer their questions. Only pooled interviews are offered at times. Shadow Secretary of State for exiting the EU, Keir Starmer, often offers only pooled interviews. That isn't proper scrutiny. One journalist can't ask questions for all journalists. The whole point is supposed to be the diversity of questioning. Here's something you may not know about British politicians. If you do something they don't like, they take it out on you. There's a phrase you'll be familiar with. Yes, they don't like it up em. Newsnight was refused all Labour front bench figures after Emma Barnett interviewed Shadow Justice Secretary Richard Bergen at the launch of the European election campaign. He didn't like being accused of lying about some of his previously stated views on anti-Semitism. So the Labour front bench sent Newsnight to Coventry. Now, I used to be a teacher. I never permitted my pupils to stop talking to each other. It would have been instant detention for Labour there. <laughs> Even last Friday night, when Theresa May was forced out of her job, a perfect opportunity for a senior Labour figure to go on Newsnight, none of them would go. Other parties engage in similar practices. During a significant period of the 2017 election campaign, Sky was banned from the Tory bus. They received no briefings, no interviews, and no questions from, were taken from them at press conferences because they'd done something the party didn't like. Recently, Channel 4 News was banned from the Brexit bus. What is all this thing of politicians banning people from buses? I believe I am the only head of news in the UK who was previously a licensed bus conductress. <laughs> and if I had gone around behaving like politicians and throwing people off buses, Blackpool Corporation would have sacked me. A couple of weeks ago, Nigel Farage didn't like Andrew Marr asking him a question about his past. The little issue of his previous support for the relaxation of the law on handguns, for example. And here's what Farage said afterwards. The BBC are now the enemy. The enemy? The enemy of whom? Well, they're not the enemy of the British people because the BBC is in fact massively trusted by the British people. And all you had to do, Nigel, was answer the question. Asking you a question doesn't make a man your enemy. And we are not your enemies. We are the friends of democracy because without free journalism, you can't have democracy. Politicians should be supporting good journalism, not attacking it. If trust is to be rebuilt in politics, it's very important that politicians stop slagging journalists who are just doing their jobs properly and start supporting good journalism. We journalists need to be sticking up for ourselves more too. As well as my Channel 4 day job, I'm the chair of the international charity the Ethical Journalism Network, which supports journalists around the world who are trying to uphold good standards in sometimes very difficult circumstances. History shows that when you want to undermine democracy, 
the first thing you do is undermine journalism. For Hitler, convincing the German people that journalists were liars was key. Round the world, whenever some evil regime wants to start murdering people, they start with murdering the journalists, or imprisoning them, or intimidating them. So criticise us when we get something wrong, and we do, but don't attack us for doing our job. But it's not just that politicians won't debate with us, they won't debate with each other. They regularly refuse to come on programmes with their opponents. In the last election, David Cameron wouldn't appear on Channel 4 and Sky with Ed Miliband, even although they were the two main rivals. We had to interview them separately. No, no offence meant to Ed Miliband, but he's not exactly scary, is he? <laughs> I've actually seen him in the street, and small children didn't run away. <laughs> it's remarkable to me that the Queen met Martin McGuinness, but some of our politicians can't meet each other. Prince Charles has even agreed to meet Donald Trump. I would love to film that. <laughs> they won't even be able to talk about the weather, will they? <laughs> the struggle to stage TV debates has prompted one of the most ghastly and humiliating experiences of my career. One day, I had to put on my best talks and go along on your behalf as my audience to see the Prime Minister's Director of Communication in Whitehall. I put the case for Channel 4 to stage a TV debate, and this awful man puffed himself up pompously and told me, I don't think the best interests of the public would be served by a debate on Channel 4. I looked at him and I thought, I have to sit here and beg you, and you are a crook, because he was a crook. He was Andy Coulson, later jailed, <laughs> later jailed for 18 months for his role in the phone hacking scandal. And after this crook refused me, he said, would you like a biscuit? <laughs> I declined his biscuit. And I went out and I stood in Whitehall and I thought, I just went to visit the office of the Prime Minister on behalf of a British public service broadcaster and a criminal offered me a biscuit. <laughs> How did my country sink this low? I would just get rid of all these people. Prime Ministers, government ministers, they just should have press officers who organise access to the press. Why are we paying for people who try to manipulate debate? And what use are they in terms of public good? Frankly, also, Theresa Lott, May's Lot did her no favours at all anyway. And the lot who worked for Cameron were in the forefront of the campaign against Brexit. Another big success for PR men and spin doctors there. But it's not just because I can't stand spin doctors that I think TV news executives like me should have as little as possible direct contact with them, lobbyists, and, for an executive like me, politicians. In my view, the more they know me, the more they will try to nobble me. I'm always hearing BBC news bosses complaining how, over the years, they were constantly rung up by people like Alistair Campbell. Oh, why did you give him your phone number? <laughs> Particular politicians and special interest groups shouldn't be allowed too much access because you don't get that special access and I'm supposed to represent your interests, not the politicians. How can we be equally fair to everyone if we meet and speak to just the few? I was contacted a few years ago by a Conservative peer. He told me that he and a group of his friends, had regular dinners with the head of BBC News and several of his top executives. I asked him who he and his friends were. What group did he represent? He explained they were not a formal organisation, but a group of people concerned that there should be fair coverage of Israel. They had got together because they were angry about some of the UK TV's reporting of Israel and they'd like to meet me 
and tell me their views. I immediately told him I couldn't spend my time meeting groups of men and their friends. Where would it end? I'd be out every night <laughs> with men and their friends. So I wouldn't be meeting him. And also, unlike the BBC, I didn't have lots of executives. There was only me, and I was a single parent. So I didn't have time to meet him. He was really not happy. He complained to my boss, and I was told to get back onto him. So I did. I said I thought about it very seriously, and I had to make a decision. Would I meet him and his friends, whoever they were, or would I meet my own child? And I decided to meet my child. He said this outcome did not make him at all happy. I said, in contrast, I was very happy indeed. <laughs> but a few months later, I got back in touch with him. I said he maybe had thought I'd ignored his approach to me, but au contraire. As a direct result of our contact, I'd commissioned a dispatches program which was about to be broadcast. Presented by Peter O'Born of the Daily Mail, it was called Britain's Israel Lobby. And I wanted to thank him for the idea, because if he'd never got in touch with me, I'd never have commissioned the programme. So that's what TV executives should do when people try to lobby them, expose them. Now, I've spent most of tonight saying that politicians should be on TV more, but sometimes they should be on TV less. I have heard a preposterous story that the BBC is devoting six one-hour programmes to the presumably self-justifying biography of David Cameron. Did he win the Second World War and I missed it? They're going to have an audience challenge on there and I think some snappy programme titles will be needed and as the BBC are my journalistic colleagues, I'm happy to help. Something akin to the way the Just William books are promoted feels apt. Um, programme one, Dave and the Huskies. <laughs> that picture could also be the publicity photo for the series, as it's always nice to see a posh boy and his hounds. Programme two, Dave saves Libya, because that one turned out well. Number three, Dave and Nick pal up. That partnership said everything about diversity in UK politics, didn't it? Eton and Westminster, Oxford and Cambridge. Next episode, Dave saves Scotland. Scotland does actually still exist as a country, so that's a big tick. Then the best episode of all, Dave's big Brexit brainwave. And finally, Dave, the shepherd caravan years. <laughs> but I wouldn't end the series in his 25,000 pound caravan. I see the last scene as Dave and Michael Cockrell in their cozies in his 8,000 pound outdoor jacuzzi in Padstow. <laughs> Cockrell turns to Dave and says, so what would you say was your greatest legacy and they both look out at the sun setting over the United Kingdom. So, what will that series cost? <laughs> Maybe a million pounds? Since the referendum campaign, it's become fashionable to ask how a sum of money could be better spent. How could a million pounds be better spent than on a six-part TV biography of a politician? Hmm. Hard, isn't it? And are they going to commission a series on Theresa May? Hmm, that title's obvious. Mayday, mayday, mayday. <laughs> now, I've been a bit mean there, so it's time for a moment of criticism of TV journalism. And there is an area where journalists need to sharpen up their act. At the start of this talk, I said a key reason we are trusted is that we are required by regulation to be duly impartial. Some of you may have missed that little word, Julie. We don't have to be impartial between truth and lies. In fact, our key job on your behalf is to tell truth from lies. You might think you can do that without us. But at Channel 4, we gave a representative sample of 1,700 people 
six news stories. Three were true, three were false. Only 4% of people identified them all correctly. And in many ways, that's not surprising. The public isn't in a position to investigate the truth or otherwise of stories. That's our central job. And partly because of pressure from politicians and lobbyists, TV journalists are not always doing that properly. Here's what a former senior BBC news executive said to me. People with opinions and arguments have used the idea of impartiality to undermine the importance of accuracy. In the referendum campaign, both sides talk tosh sometimes. Look how duly impartial I am there. And they were sometimes allowed to get away with their tosh because some journalists thought it was their job to report tosh, not to expose it. In Gary Gibbon's excellent small book about the referendum, Breaking Point, he writes, one broadcast journalist told me how his bulletins were strictly almost to the second timed, so each campaign's interview clips achieved perfect balance in each report. The bosses no doubt thought they were rigorously implementing impartiality, but they were ducking their duties, abdicating in favour of a stopwatch. In coverage, journalists were often loath to call out lies as lies. One of the most famous interviews of the campaign was that by the pro-Brexit Conservative, Penny Morden. She announced on Andrew Marshall that Turkey was definitely going to join the EU and the UK wouldn't be able to stop them. In fact, accession of a candidate state has to be approved unanimously by the Council of the EU, which is made up of representatives from each member state. Andrew Marr told her he found what she was saying strange. Well, it might have been strange, but it was untrue. And when politicians don't tell the truth, we have the right to say it. The obsession with impartiality is even more dangerous when it comes to science. When I worked at Granada, even although we knew smoking caused cancer, when we did a smoking story, and I was a more junior journalist, we'd be told to get some bloke on saying it didn't. That sort of bad science reporting has continued, in particular with MMR and, of course, climate change. I've made three films in total about the awful Andrew Wakefield, each one exposing him, starting in the late 1990s. But others have given this ludicrous man space. Panorama, great as it is as a strand, broadcast a film back in 2002 with special access to Andrew Wakefield at work and at home. Here's what the BBC publicity said. As parents continue to shun the controversial triple jab, despite mounting fears of a measles epidemic, Panorama asks, how safe is MMR? Even then, we knew the answer, really safe? You didn't need to make that programme. And 17 years on from programmes like that, we've got a quarter of a million teenagers now who didn't get the vaccination. They shouldn't have been at home with Andrew Wakefield. They should have been exposing them, as we did, and helping to get them struck off. We shouldn't report drivel. Last week, I heard John Humphreys say on Radio 4 that everyone finally accepts climate change is happening. Hello, John. Most of us accepted that a long time ago. Do you know how the BBC found out? David Attenborough told them. <laughs> Imagine Galileo came along today and said that contrary to what had been believed previously, the Earth goes round the sun. Can you picture how the Today programme would cover it? They'd need to get an opposing viewpoint. The editor would demand, get Nigel Lawson. And some innocent researcher would say, but Nigel Lawson isn't a scientist. How about that Brian Cox from Manchester University? Can we get him? The editor scoffs. He's an astronomer. 
you'll just agree with Galileo. <laughs> the whole point is that we need to have someone who says the opposite, and if he's a Tory grandee, double whammy for the BBC. Our top priority as journalists should be telling the truth about science. Journalists have failed just as politicians have failed. So science students of Manchester University, please enter our profession urgently. Your nation needs you. Our democracy is facing some critical issues and politicians and journalists are in fact going to have to work together to sort them. I started my journalistic career on a local paper in East London, the Waltham Forest Guardian. It had nearly a hundred pages. We covered every council meeting and all the planning meetings. But local newspapers have been decimated. And without local journalism, you can't have a properly functioning local democracy. This is a democratic crisis. Now, local councils are reporting on themselves. Politicians all over this country are reporting themselves. But there is a huge threat looming over our whole democratic system, and politicians need to get a grip, because it's been journalists, very notably Channel 4, The Observer, and The New York Times, but others too, who have had to take the lead here where politicians failed. Elections around the world are being fought less and less on doorsteps and hustings. Never shall we lose our faith and courage, and never shall we fail in exertion and resolve. And more and more on screens and social media. It's an online information war where often unseen hands harvest your personal data, tapping into your hopes and fears for the greatest political yield. And one British company is at the very heart of it. They've worked under the radar in elections in Nigeria, Kenya, the Czech Republic, India and Argentina. But they are best known for their work in America. There can be no prosperity without law That company is Cambridge Analytica. Is that immediately recording? Yeah, yeah. After a four-month undercover investigation, tonight a glimpse into how they really operate. Right, yeah. Yeah, it does look like they're looking. Prepared, it seems, to ruin their clients' opponents through handouts and honey traps. Send some girls around to Andy's house. Through sex, secrets, and spies. I know people who used to work for MI5, MIC. Old style tactics went into the new. We just put the information into the bloodstream, the internet, and then, then watch it grow. Our democratic system needs to be strengthened to deal with this threat. As Carol Cadwallader of The Observer has said, what happens to democracy when a hundred years of electoral laws are disrupted by technology? Across Europe in the EU elections, we have just had Russian disinformation websites and social media accounts linked to Russia and far-right groups have been spreading disinformation. Researchers have identified tactics and fingerprints similar to those seen in the 2016 US elections. People are talking about whether we might have an election ourselves soon, and how will we know if the public will be properly informed and that election will be fairly fought? Here is a scary statement about the external enemies of our democracy and what they are up to. The goal here is bigger than one election. It is to constantly divide, increase distrust, and undermine our faith in institutions and democracy itself. Both politicians and journalists will have to rise together to that huge challenge. But meanwhile, 
We have the pleasure of the Conservative Party leadership hustings to look forward to. And I have a great idea about how they should be run. Here is the form that I suggest. A form of cooperative argumentative dialogue between individuals based on asking and answering questions to stimulate critical thinking and to draw out ideas and underlying presuppositions. Yes, you've spotted it, the Socratic method. Now, wouldn't be that be refreshing, but don't hold your breath. Thank you. Maybe I'll sit down. So, thank you so much, Dorothy, for that um, fascinating, informative, funny, and most appropriate lecture. It was appropriate because of the time. What better time? And we couldn't have predicted that when we're in the midst of I political change. I predicted it. Oh, you did? Okay. <laughs> when I thought of the title, that's my job. I have to see ahead. But equally, I would argue, appropriate in place. Because if universities can't be places where we ask tough questions, we welcome differing opinions and open debate, where can you? By the way, we don't know platform. But um, Would you have let Plato in? I mean, like, if you wanted to be in a like, junior time, lecture. Yes, so Actually, probably we would. Probably we would. We have let in some controversial speakers. But we shall see. Anyway, uh, Dorothy's kindly agreed to answer a few questions. And we've got one there, and then one in pink a little bit further forward, and then one over on the far right. Hello. Yeah? Hello, yeah. Uh, do you think there's been a deterioration in the quality of our politicians over the years? Or am I just getting old? <laughs> no, I, I have to be very careful about giving any opinion at all because I'm just a journalist. But no, that, no, that bloke in the pub, you know, there's a reason I quoted him. You know, in the past, these politicians would put themselves up for an hour's really difficult grilling by Brian Walden and Robin Day, and that just isn't happening. But I don't think our politicians are necessarily less good politicians. I think they must think they're less good politicians, or their spin doctors do. You know, they should put themselves up there, and maybe they'll be terrific, and then more than 20% of people will trust them. Thank you. There's one there, and then one further down, and then we'll go over that way. Hi, Dorothy. Yeah. Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Hi, Dorothy. Thank you very much for that lecture. It was very, very stimulating. Um, my question relates to um, the wider sphere of journalism. So. For me, Channel 4 is one of the few outlets that is impartial when it um, delivers news. But how do you then take on the print media, as television media, who print a lot of lies, especially um, the tabloids, Daily Mail, or what have you, they, they, they do put out a lot of disinformation. How do you then want to tackle that in the face of uh, wanting to report the truth? Well, throughout my life, we've had the tabloid media and as I said tonight, we know that the figures show that British people know that a lot of what is in those papers is untrue. It's not my job to go about investigating all the stories of newspapers. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do that. My job is a different job. And, uh, but the point that you make is correct. We are incredibly lucky here because our TV has got to be duly impartial, it's got to be accurate. When we make mistakes, we get into trouble. And it, it, you say Channel 4 News is great, well, write to Theresa May, Jeremy Corbyn, and all these politicians and say, Channel 4 News is great, could you go on it? Thank you. One here, and then we'll go over the other side. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, you talked about uh, 
the need for journalists to stand up for themselves uh, in order to rebalance the power dynamic between the media and politicians and other public figures. I wonder how is it that they should stand up for themselves? How is it that you, you bring broadcasters together when there's so much internal competition between various broadcasters? How, how you unify broadcasters uh, and empower them to, to be able to ask those more difficult questions as a whole? Well, there should be division between us, and you'll have heard tonight that I've been very critical of the BBC, and you will also have heard tonight that I've quoted them and talked about how we have supported each other. I mean, a key reason I'm here is because I believe we have to stand up for each other more, and I keep saying to other television journalists, you've got to come out and speak in favour of journalism more. You mustn't just let, when these politicians attack us so unfairly, you mustn't just put up with it. You, you know, we've got to hit back. I'm not the Queen. I can speak up. Thank you. I think there was one over there. Yes. Good evening, Dorothy. Um, my name's Sean King, and I'm very grateful for a very interesting and informative talk. Thank you very much. My question is on bias and um, the BBC and public sector funding, really. I mean, my confidence in the BBC as an impartial outlet for news has been rocked over the past couple of years, really. Um, and I'm not sure that I do trust it anymore. And I certainly favour Channel 4 News in the evening over the BBC. Now. Wise man. <laughs> Just stop watching the BBC and watch Channel 4 and all your problems are over. I think... But I'm, you can complain to, to Ofcom. And, you know, do complain to Ofcom. If you think there's something wrong, don't complain to me. They've got a regulator. Highly paid, too. They need something to do. But my, my, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I have done that. Um, I didn't get very far with Ofcom. But anyway, um, my question really is whether it is still desirable and possible to have an impartial public sector broadcasting in the news um, that's funded so directly or that whose, whose funding is so directly controlled by government. Yes. And you you, you keep using the word impartial. As I keep saying, it's not impartial. It's duly impartial. And if the BBC gets something wrong, hold it to account. But... You know, we are very lucky in this country to have the BBC. I, I've attacked it several times there, but that's to keep them up to the mark. <laughs> Thank you. So how do we protect them from government control? Or how do we have confidence that they're protected from well, government control? Well, you are the British people. You should, every time you see, think you, the government's trying to control them, or you, you think that they weren't fair, you should make a complaint about it. You should talk about it, you should write about it, you should discuss it. Because we are both affected by individual complaints and also by the tenor of general public debate. So I said earlier that when we heard lots and lots of people saying they couldn't stand hearing all these you know, male interviewers savaging politicians, you know, that wasn't necessarily the subject of a complaint to Ofcom, but we listened. We do listen. Thank you. Thank you. Always complain a lot. I do. <laughs> One right down at the front. Just wait for the microphone. It's racing towards you. <laughs> uh, you might want to say that the problem is that the journalists and the reporters have great prejudices, prejudices instinctively. Prejudices against Trump, prejudices against Brexit, and um, prejudices, uh, I mean, these are instinctive. You, you seem to all have, not all, but most have. That's one reason why I'm very suspicious of you all. You um, should be suspicious of us. I'm always suspicious of everybody. Now, journalists can have instincts, but I've got no interest in them whatsoever. Um, I, you know, uh, there are journalists who have got particular personal prejudices and they have to leave them at the door. And you will not get on at Channel 4 or at a major broadcaster in this country, in my view, if, uh, in this era in particular, if you uh, constantly are bringing your own prejudices to bear. I have criticised Donald Trump tonight 
that's not because I'm prejudiced. It's because he tells lies. And I can say he tells lies. He tells lies. How many lies does he tell? I don't know. Someone said 10,000. I've spotted one. He tells lies. So I can criticise a man for telling lies without being accused of being a, a prejudiced, biased journalist. On Brexit, uh, I, I think it's very, very important all the time that journalists leave their prejudices at home. And if you as viewers, just as I as a TV boss, think at all that a journalist's personal view about Brexit is coming out in news coverage, we have to stamp on that. I absolutely agree with you. And I think, you know, what you're both talking about a bit is your feel that journalists as a group have a bit of a liberal bias. And I think we need to encourage people or with a very wide range of views to make programmes. I mean, today we won the main television business award um, for a programme that Liam Hamilton made, uh, 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 Liam Halligan made from the Sunday Telegraph. That's really important. The programme that I referred to about the Israel lobby, that was made by Peter Oborn. And at Channel 4, it's been very, very important to me that a, a white, people with a wide range of political views come on the programme. But, uh, and we've, we've got to fight the, the, the bit of a liberal prejudice thing. When I started at Granada, on Granada Reports, they all thought I was absolutely brilliant. I mean, they would just go, God, this woman, she's got so many stories every day. It's fantastic. And that's because they all read The Guardian. And I... <laughs> I read The Daily Telegraph. And The Daily Telegraph, particularly then, was full of stories. And they'd go, has anybody got any good stories? And I would say, giant hailstones have fallen in Chester, injuring a cat. And they'd go, could we get one of those giant hailstones? <laughs> this is true, we got the giant hailstone in the, in the studio. And even ab about two years ago, I met the first producer ever that I had on that program at a party, and she said, Dorothy was so brilliant. And I said, no, I was the only person who actually read the Daily Telegraph. I'm not saying it was my favorite paper, but um, it has a lot of stories in it. Just time for one short, and if it's short, possibly two, but... Thank you. Um, yeah? You'll have to bear with me, my voice doesn't work very well. You mentioned science and the media, um, that's something of interest. You mentioned tobacco um, and the anti-vaxxers and this kind of thing. Um, tobacco was perhaps the first big scientific issue. That, mm. Now, the media, journalism, whatever, aren't known for reporting science very accurately, but we live in an age where actually the things that scientists discover are massively yes. important for policy. So I've got a little list. Air quality, water shortages, climate change, mm. um, minerals on the seabed, antibiotic resistance. All these things have massive policy implications, and yet we've still got anti-vaxxers on YouTube and all the rest of it. Yeah, and one of the problems is that all the people who get on in TV did PPE at Oxford, and what use are they in these circumstances? May I say, Nigel Lawson, who's the bloke that the Today programme got in trouble with, he did PPE at Oxford. They're everywhere, these people. I think Michael Crick did it. <laughs> I think he did. We, and I, I'm really serious. Sometimes people think that when journalists get things wrong about science, it's deliberate. It's actually, they didn't... They don't know anything about science. That I really mean that we need science graduates to enter TV. So, on that note, I, as a scientist, I will encourage... Yeah, you can, you can I, have a I job. I a new job. I can take a new job. Oh. It all goes wrong here. <laughs> Might be easy, actually, at times. Uh, but I shall certainly encourage our science uh, graduates to go into journalism. I'm, I will point them your way. So I'm now, you just stay there, I'm going to now invite Catherine Leopold, who leads our Alumni Association, on many of your behalf, to say a few words of thanks. Catherine. Thank you. So um, I finally get to say, and finally, um, because and finally... That's ITV. Me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> However, in the interests of due impartiality, it felt like I could probably get away okay. with it tonight. Um, 
It's really difficult doing these vote of thanks bits because you've had the main event and this has been a particularly fabulous main event which has taken us from Plato, windmills, Trump, Brexit, science, a little bit of journalistic endeavour call to arms, all in the space of one talk, which has been utterly wonderful to be in the audience for. Um, I do watch Jon Snow and I do admire his ties, so perhaps that will make up for the ITV reference okay. as well. Um, I'm Catherine Leopold and I'm Chair of the Alumni Association. And I'm tremendously proud to be Chair of the Alumni Association because the University of Manchester provides space for this kind of discussion and this kind of event. So thank you, Dorothy, on behalf of the association. We have a uh, next lecture, it's part of the Your Manchester Insight series. Now, I have to say this very carefully, it's on the 19th of June and it's Spatters and Lies, Technologies of Truth in the Sam Shepherd case, 1954 to 1966. So continuing our... Simple uh, title there. Yes, yeah. Pissy. I think, trust me, I'm a politician, was a bit clearer. <laughs> <laughs> Not a politician. So please join us for that. Please also now join us downstairs for uh, a drink in the exhibition. And please join me in saying a huge thank you to Dorothy.